action basic training video. Today we're covering the topic of combined arms warfare. What that really means is a fancy way of saying we're going to have tanks, armored cars, and infantry. Okay, that's really what this is about. No artillery, just main guns uh, and a tank weapons and things. Uh, the reason for this is we're trying to focus on kind of the vehicle rules and how really how do the vehicle destruction rules really work. Because though we touched on them in the previous lessons and the previous field exercise, there's a lot more to see when it comes to uh, these vehicles. I mean, you've got certain vehicles have single arcs of fire with certain weapons. Some have multiple weapons, some have turrets. And we're going to play with all of these features of vehicles in one system or one uh, video series here. So in the combined arms uh, lessons, we're going to be looking at how tanks can actually move because tanks are different than just the armor cars and half-tracks that we've talked about in the, or we've seen in the previous field exercise. Tanks, which have a armor value of 8 plus, have abilities that tanks of uh, 7 plus armor don't have. So your armor values definitely have an impact. The Whether it's tracked or half-tracked, the armor vehicle, that will matter. That will affect how it plays. Whether it's open topped or closed top will matter. So we're going to cover a lot of these vehicle rule concepts and especially pay a lot more attention to how do you actually destroy a vehicle. Okay, And that we're going to play on the... Uh, we're going to go down to the classroom setting now and we're going to talk about some of those rules. Alright, so meet you there in a second. Hello, welcome to the classroom. Now, today we're going to cover the rest of the vehicle's rules. There's really not a, a lot of them, but there's some very, very specific differences. We're not considering the vehicles as transports. Okay. Now, in a typical reinforced platoon list, you really only have two vehicle slots. One is for you know tanks, self-propelled guns, uh, mobile artillery, stuff like that. And the second one's your armor car slot. Okay. Examples of armor things that would fit in the armor car slot, for example, might be the uh, the Vickers. Uh, sorry, the uh, like a. Uh, Re recce version of the universal carrier. This happens to be a machine gun version. Uh, armor car might be, the slot might be taken up by a motorcycle. Uh, other than that, you can have actual armored cars, and there's dozens of them across the different lists. Other than that, everything else is pretty much considered a tank of some sort. Uh, it could be self propelled artillery or anti aircraft. Uh, in this case, self propelled anti tank gun. This would be a light tank, regular Cromwells. Uh, even if it's got machine guns only, it's considered a tank, right? Now, the, you know, when you look at bolt action, is not going to be a lot of tanks in most lists. There are a couple theater selectors that will have some additional tanks, but in general, you don't have that many. All right, before we get to some of the more uh, interesting rules, let's cover some things we talked a little bit about in the last video, like pinning. Okay, now most of the transports are either soft skin or they're open-topped armored, and so pretty much everything can pin those things. Uh, I did mention that there were some, there might be some fully enclosed transports, and those would follow the same rules we're going to talk about today in regards to pinning and most of these vehicles. Now, for the record, we're going to pull these out shortly. The uh, this motorcycle sidecar, that is a soft skin vehicle, so that really wouldn't count in this armored vehicle discussion. Here we've got an open top Vickers uh, machine gun carrier, and here we have an open top M10. In this particular case, it's the Achilles uh, M10C in the British Army. Both of these are open top, so we're going to ignore those for a second. Let's pull them off. Everything else here is 7 plus armor or higher. There's 7. 8, 9, for example. This is an 8. Why is this important? <clears throat> well, when it comes to pinning the closed-top vehicles like this, fully enclosed armored vehicles, whether it's an armored car like the Marmon Harrington or, or Otter, or one of these larger tanks like the Sherman uh, 2C here, or uh, 2A, what happens is you're dealing with the fact that now only heavy weapons can possibly hurt them, and in a lot of cases, some of the smaller heavy weapons cannot hurt them. So now crew quality actually has an impact on whether or not you take a pin. So <clears throat> these are your, uh, these are all seven plus armored. These two are eight, and the rest of these are nine. So on a 
heavy machine gun at short range will be able to hurt these vehicles here. However, a heavy machine gun at long range won't. A heavy machine gun won't be able to hurt any of these. Okay, anti-tank rifles or auto cannons with plus two pen. Okay, now they can start hurting uh, these, but they cannot hurt the heavier guns. So now we have to pay attention. When you look at the pen modifier of the attack that's actually hit a vehicle, if the pen value plus the six, the, a maximum roll on day six, which is six, with all your modifiers, cannot hurt the vehicle, cannot actually damage the vehicle, there's a chance there won't be a pin. Okay, so, basically, if you can hurt the vehicle, you know, actually roll a damage, on a, equal its armor value or higher, and roll in a damage table, it guarantees that the vehicle is going to be taking a pin for hitting, and potentially whatever pin you get from the uh, damage chart. Now, if you cannot hurt it, veteran units, veteran tanks, will never take a pin. Inexperienced will always take a pin, regardless whether you can damage the vehicle or not. Regular vehicles, it's a 50-50. So if the weapon cannot damage or ex actually meet the armor value of the tank, then you roll a d6. On a 4 or better, it ignores the pin. On a 1 to 3, it actually takes the pin, as if the uh, it was an inexperienced unit. Okay, so that's basically how, with these larger, more heavily, heavily armored vehicles, and fully enclosed, can be impacted by pins based on their quality, crew quality. All right, so we're going to talk about the types of weapon mounts you've got on vehicles. There's three. We're going to call casement or hull mounted. We're going to have turret, and then we're going to have pintle. Okay. Casement or hull mounted, uh, an example would be this medium machine gun here on the hull in the Sherman. It will fire out the front arc. The front arc is 90 degrees, so it's forward facing, right? Now, some t vehicles have fixed weapons in a different arc. They will fire within that arc only, okay? So you have potentially like a howitzer our main gun coming out the front like would be in a Stug or a pre M7 Priest or a British Sexton. Or you've got the machine guns. Okay. So that's hull or case mounted, casement. Now you've got next the turret, which is obvious. Everything that's a tank has a turret. That's the definition of a tank. And it will be able to hit essentially 360 degrees with an exception. Uh, there are some vehicles that have turrets mounted in such a position as they can't cover all 360 degrees. So turrets have the ability to shoot in multiple directions. Now this is important because in order to change the facing of the front facing weapon, a hull mounted weapon, you actually need to move or give the tank an advance order. With a turret you don't. It can fire and change direction of the main gun in the turret before it fires and you don't have the movement penalties. Okay? Now the last one is a pintle mount, and this is a good example. It's a, essentially a machine gun on top of the tank that's basically crew served. Okay. Now, pintle has a special rule that allows it to fire 360 degrees, just like a turret would, and it actually can be used for flak. Now, we'll talk about flak in a later video, but the key for a pintle mounted weapon is it, it can be used optionally. However, if you do choose to use it, that means the commander or a gunner is going to come up out of their hatch and they're going to fire that weapon. And from that point until the end of the current turn, the tank is going to be considered open top. Now, if you happen to have a tank that's already open top, it's no big deal. Go ahead and do it. But in the case of a buttoned up top uh, tank like this, a fully enclosed armored vehicle, you may not want to go open top by firing the pintle mounted machine gun because yes you'll be able to get some additional shots down range but now small arms fire can put pins on your tank so be careful with that so those are the three types of weapons if you are mounting positions of weapons and pay close attention to the rules within each because it's going to matter as you you know some of them have actually for example the pintle mount you don't actually need to 
be exposed. You don't go open topped because uh, it's remotely operated from inside. So very, very few entries like that, but pay attention to your vehicle rules to know for sure. All right, so let's talk about, you know, actually the, the actual firing of the weapons. The first thing you do is you always measure line of sight down the weapon barrel or from the weapon position. So this, you're going to sight down the barrel or you're going to sight down uh, from the position of the bow mounted machine gun or you're going to fire from the position of the, or measure from the position of the uh, pinto mount. Okay, and that's what you're going to do draw a line of sight from. Okay. However, when you're measuring distance to target, you measure from the edge of the hull, not the gun. Okay, keeping it really simple. It's hull to hull in the case of vehicles. It's hull to the closest torso or base of an infantry model uh, or artillery model. Okay, so that's how you measure with these. Now, this is very important when you're looking at something like these dual turreted tanks. These are twin turrets. They ostensibly have 360 degree arcs, but you'll notice they can't actually turn and put fire down. You know, you can't basically shoot through your own turret. So, though this tank actually has quite a distance it can cover, it basically is the entire front arc all the way through to the entire rear arc plus part of the opposite side. It can't fire 100, you know, completely. So you're, you're going to be measuring line of sight from the, the turret down that direction. So if the, if the turret can't physically move in that direction, you really shouldn't be able to shoot at it. Okay. Now when you're shooting at an enemy unit, you, with every vehicle, you determine, you declare what each weapon you're going to fire is going to fire at. Okay. Before you do any dice rolling. So... For this particular tank here, you've got a hull mount, you've got the turret, and then you've got the pinto. You can, you can target three different units. Okay, So you declare those first, and then you measure it. Now, some, th some things to think about. There's two special weapon loadouts that are important. One is coaxial, which this tank has, and one is uh, multiple mounts. So this turret has two light autocannons. Both of those light autocannons have to fire at the same target. You have no choice. Uh, because they're mounted, you know, together. As opposed to this, which has two separate turrets, each with a mini machine gun, they can target two separate units. Now, in the case of coaxial mounts, you have to decide whether you're going to fire the main gun or the coaxial machine gun that's with that, or coaxial weapon, I should say. So this gives you the option, the flexibility to fire an infantry for the machine gun or an actual unit with, the, uh, you know, a vehicle with the main gun. But you have to declare that again before you do any rolling at all. All right, let's look at the. There's one extra rule when it, that uh, is added when you have take damage on an armored vehicle that has a turret. Okay, it's called turret jam. Now this is oftentimes you forget about it because it just it, it flows through the, the the game. You just kind of play through and you, you roll on the table and you apply the results and but. By the damage table, they actually have a, a note that says whenever you roll on the table and it, the tank survives, you should roll for turret jam. So it's not actually listed in the actual uh, body of the chart. It's a footnote, sort of. But turret jam is very its very simple. Uh, on a, you roll a die. On a 4+, plus, the turret's jammed, and it can't move. can't change its arc. Now, in the case of uh, multiple turret vehicles, like the tank in the center, uh, you're going to randomly roll which turret is jammed. This is a simple rule to apply. Uh, there are some games you'll see where they house rule it out. Uh, I know I've been to uh, events where they don't use it at all. Uh, now the way it's written in the book, the specific way you apply turret jam is as follows. Let me take this tank off for a second. Here's a tank. Uh, we're going to use this tank here. And when you roll a turret jam, and you, so this, you, you find out the turret is jammed. The turret is jammed in the direction the attack came from. So essentially, wherever the unit happens to be, whether it's side, front, rear, that's you basically just move the turret into to point in that direction. That's the direction it's jammed. So it's the it's jammed in the direction of the attack that inflicted the turret jam. Okay, that's the way the rule is written. Now, 
One of the things that we do here, I want to put this out there because it, it's a house rule that I think is a little more uh, exciting sometimes. Um, what we do is with our tanks, we don't r uh, run it as written. We actually run it a little differently. Whatever position the tank's turret is in when the shot is made and the turret jam is rolled, that's where it's stuck. So if, for example, this tank decided to fire out of its side arc at a target to its right, but it was hit from the front or the, the its left and gets a turret jam, this is the position the turret is jammed in because it was engaging a target to the to its right when the turret jam happened. So if it hasn't fired at all and it's you know, still pointed forward, it's jammed forward, okay? So we, we kind of play a little bit like that. So feel free to, again, house rules can be applied, but remember that as it's written, the turret is jammed in the direction of the attack that inflicted the turret jam. All right, one thing I want to highlight uh, is open-topped armored vehicles that aren't transports. Uh, just in general, open-top vehicles, especially the stronger 8-plus or 9-plus armor, you don't think about it, but because they're open top, that means that small arms fire can cause pins. Even though they can't penetrate to roll on the damage table, you're at least going to pin. So just roll to hit. If you hit, there's a pin, you're done with evaluating. You don't need to roll a damage table or anything. So remember, open top armored targets can be pinned with small arms fire. All right, let's, let's talk about close combat with vehicles, with, yeah, I guess armored vehicles specifically. Now, things are a little different. We covered the close combat with um, transports and soft skin with infantry uh, last session. What we're going to cover today is actually the close combat which involves armored vehicles that are fully enclosed, okay? Because last week, or last lesson, we were talking about open-top armored uh, vehicles, transports, and so that's the rules we covered there. But it's interesting, once you get against a tank or a vehicle, even an armored car, that's fully enclosed, such as this Vickers tank, which is a 7 plus armor, infantry are no longer free to simply assault it, okay? They actually need to make a special order test, even if they have no pin markers on them. If they wish to assault a vehicle, an, ar sorry, an armored vehicle that's fully enclosed, they need to make an order test at minus three. And of course, addition pins and missing NCOs simply add to that in order to make that assault. Okay? The only exception is when the attacking infantry squad has anti-tank grenades. Then they don't need to make that special order test. Okay? Okay, so... We've got infantry that now that can charge tanks, but now actually some vehicles can charge infantry. Now, the way this works is only vehicles with an armor value of 8 or better can actually assault or charge infantry or artillery pieces. Now, we'll cover the rules for artillery in the next lesson, but this kind of applies to both. So as long as this vehicle, sorry, the tank, is... You know, it has an 8 or better armor. For example, this Vickers has a 7 plus armor. It cannot charge infantry. It can, however, uh, be charged by infantry. So it's a little weak, uh, weak in that sense. But this vehicle being a Sherman with a 9 front armor, or this Crusader with an 8 front armor, both of them can charge either of these target units. Now to execute a charge, it's the same rules as before. The, the vehicle declares its target within 12 inches and has to issue a run order and then move at least half its distance. Now, to execute a charge with a vehicle, you cannot pivot because you're giving it a run order. Okay, And you'll move it. So this is a 9-inch advance, so it's going to have to move at least 9 point something inches. So I'm going to make it move 12 inches. And it's going to move 12, and as long as it's going to be moving through the actual, and over models, it's going to end up here, okay? Having charged through. Now, you don't do actual combat here. What happens is, if the tank is further than 6 inches away, that infantry can fire its 
weapons at the tank. You know, for example, uh, if it had anti-tank guns, uh, like Panzerfaust or Panzerschreck or something like that. If it has no way to respond, it, it won't. There's no sense in doing reaction fire, and you simply move the model. The target unit takes a morale check, even if they're fanatics. They're going to take a regular morale check here. The key is, if the unit fails its morale check, it is removed from the game. Basically, surrenders or flees. If it survives or passes that morale test, then you've put the tank where you said it was going to end, and then you move the infantry out of the way so they're more than one inch away from the vehicle, but still in unit coherency. Okay, so let's set things up a little differently here. We're going to have a situation where we're going to do the same run order, and there's, but there's a couple units in the way. We're going to be running up to 18 inches, right? So I can move well past the artillery unit here, you know, completely off camera. And so what I'm going to do is run, and I'm first going to make contact with this unit. If this unit fails its morale test, it's removed from the board, and I continue on. If it makes its morale test, and I'm continuing through, it stays put, and then I engage this next unit. And it, unfortunately, being an artillery unit, because I'm actually doing a run through the artillery unit, the artillery unit, there is no test. It's automatically destroyed. So in the end, this unit goes away, and I move the tank through it, and there is the end of the run that I would choose to do. So let's say they, pa they would pass the morale test and stay back in the position they are, but the artillery unit's destroyed, pulled off the table with its order die, and the tank remains in position. Okay? Okay, now we're going to talk about some other fun. <laughs> it was rare, but it did happen. There were times when vehicles would charge other vehicles. Okay? Now, this is... This will apply basically to any armored vehicle. And I'll, you know, uh, soft skin trucks can't do this. Soft skin vehicles can't do this. But other armored vehicles can. So... What's going to happen is if the target, uh, we're going to pretend this is the tank that's charging, okay? Just to keep it simple. Again, it's going to be running straight forward. It can't do any pivots. But if it targets a model with a 7 plus armor, it just has to make its normal order check if necessary. If it's going to target an 8 plus armor or higher, then it will need to make the same. Uh, order test at minus three that an infantry would have to do. There is no way for a tank or fully enclosed armored vehicle to avoid that minus three penalty because you really don't want to damage your tank. The reality is in close combat vehicle to vehicle both models could be damaged or even potentially destroyed. Now this is even, this order test is with minus three is required even if the target unit is open topped. Okay, the target armored vehicle is a open topped. So it's not easy to pull the to pull this off. But when it happens, it's the, it's executed the same way. But what happens is the the tank is gonna move forward its full distance until it makes contact and then it stops. Then you resolve the attack on the vehicle. Okay, we're gonna make this simple. Uh, we're not going to do anything. There's nothing fancy about arcs and facings in this, in vehicle, what I'll call close combat. All that matters is you're running into them. Now, you, again, you're going to give a run order, so you're going to move your full distance without pinning. There's at least that over half. The f difference here is you'll move the vehicle forward until it comes into contact, and then it will stop. You don't go any further. Okay, at this point you'll make the evaluation about the actual, you know, what what damage was done. And this is not done like in the in other earlier close combats. This is simply a roll-off between the two tanks themselves. So what you do is each player will roll a die and add their vehicle's armor value to it. So in this case, 
this the one this pl charging player will roll a d6 and add nine, and the owner of the crusader would own or would roll a d6 and add eight, and then you compare the two dice. Okay, so we sh we're going to use the translucent die for the Sherman, and the opaque one for the uh, crusader. All right, so. You're going to roll the dice and add the value. So let's just go ahead and pretend they rolled a 6 and a 6. Uh, that just happened this way. We're going to start off where there's a winner. 6 plus 9, okay, 7, uh, 15, and then 6 plus 8, 14. So the Sherman tank has won. As a result, the Crusader is actually the loser. Now what happens is the loser, if the vehicle is a soft skin vehicle, it's automatically destroyed. You don't you still have to make this roll, so it'd been a six the die roll plus six to attack the vehicle and but if it's a soft skin, it's automatically destroyed. If, however, it has a seven plus armor or better, you instead roll on the damage table. Now here's the thing. If the loser's armor value is greater than the winner's armor value, it would be a superficial damage. But in this case, the winner has a higher armor value, 9, than the defender, which is 8. So this would roll on the damage table, and whatever result happens, is result is rolled, happens to the Crusader. So in this case, 5, it's destroyed. Now, had the Crusader won, and the Sherman lost. The Sherman would take the damage, even though it's the one that rammed. Now, since the armor value of this the Crusader is lower than the Sherman, the Sherman takes a glancing hit. And so it would be the die roll minus three, so in this case, stun. You do apply the pins from that result on the damage table. Now, what happens if the die rolls plus the armor value is tie? So, 9 plus 5 is 14, 6 plus 8 is 14. Both of them lose. Okay? Neither of them win. So, what the next thing you'll do is you will, again, each, each one will roll on the table. So, you'll compare armor values. So, since the Crusader is less than the... Uh, Sherman, the Sherman will take a glancing hit, whereas the Crusader will take a normal uh, damage roll. Okay, and just ro you roll it and apply it. All right. So after the now, since the if the winner of this is important, the winner, the winning tank will never take damage unless its armor value is equal to or lower than the uh, target. So it is possible that even if it's a that you're charging, you can still take damage. For example, if, if we did it this way, if the uh, Crusader had charged the Sherman, if the Sherman loses, the Sherman takes a, a glancing hit in this case because its damage value is higher than the Crusader. But the Crusader, being a winner, has a lower damage value than the Sherman, it will also take its own superficial damage. In fact, if both the charging model and the target are the same armor value, the charging model will take superficial damage. Okay, now once you've resolved the pins and the damage against each vehicle, you turn the order dice for both vehicles to down. Okay? Now, if it doesn't, if it hasn't acted yet, you place a down order. So, in this case, if the Crusader had not taken order, yet, order test yet, and the Sherman charged it, whether it's destroyed or not, it will get a down order. And the Sherman will get a down order. Now, the final thing you're going to do is, regardless of who wins whether you're being assaulted or assaulted, both vehicles will take one pin marker in addition to anything they've already gotten. So when you, pin, when you charge, you're going to give yourself a pin. You're also going to give the opponent a pin. 
So there may be some benefit sometimes to charging an enemy with your own tank. So I hope that kind of explain, uh, kind of gets across how you actually can ram enemy tanks and potentially take them out. Unfortunately, you have run the risk of damaging right, your so own. There's three more rules I want to cover real quick that may apply to your model, your vehicle model, uh, because they, they're pretty prevalent uh, in some national lists and some uh, slots, vehicle slots. For example, a lot of armored cars have the recce rule. R E C C E. Okay, recce basically allows the uh, vehicle to react to being targeted by either an assault or a, a shooting attack. Just like infantry can choose to go down, a recce vehicle, the one with the recce special rule, can choose to react to being targeted. All right, so in order to do a recce move, you can't have an order die on your vehicle already. Okay, what you'll do is. If you decide to actually make the recce move, you'll take an order die out of your out of the bag and put it next to the vehicle and with the down order showing. And now you'll make either an advance or a run move with all normal restrictions and any special rules your vehicle has for its abilities. And then here's your goal: you make that move and you will you have to end up or you're trying to end up out of line of sight, further away, or in. Um, stronger, better cover, so you have a better cover save. You can't use the recce move to actually move closer to an enemy unit, or the enemy firing unit, okay? So as long as you meet all those requirements, you can make the recce move. Now, if the target that just reacted is now out of range or out of line of sight, the attacker blows his, his basically wastes his shot. His shot misses, okay? If, however, it's still within range and line of sight, and arc, okay, he can actually shoot at it, he will resolve the attack at the new location that the vehicle is occupying, using whatever the appropriate facing is of the vehicle, whatever the appropriate cover now is, and execute the attack normally. So that's how you deal with, use the recce rule. Alright, now some vehicles, especially some of the French early war ones, uh, well, French are early war armies, have a special rule called slow. There are, there are several armies that have this, but the French, a lot of their units have it. Slow essentially is a vehicle, a tracked vehicle, that does not move as fast as a normal tracked vehicle. Tracked vehicles can normally move 9 inches on an advance, 18 on a run. Slow vehicles move 6 inches on advance and 12 inches on a run. A lot of uh, British, all, matter of fact, all the British infantry tanks, have that same rule because they're meant to keep up with the infantry and that's about it. So again, slow means you can only advance six inches or run 12 inches with a tracked vehicle. Okay, now finally, there's the slow load rule. Very, there aren't many vehicles with this, but some of the some of the fan favorites for, uh, especially in the Soviets, have this rule. Slow load essentially means that the weapon took longer to load and cycle through a round of ammunition than other tanks or vehicles. So. To reflect this, a vehicle with the slow load rule cannot be given an order die as the first unit activated during a turn. It has to be the second or uh, act, unit activated or later. Now, one way to get around this uh, is to actually give an officer with, within its, his command range the first order die and then do a snap two. Since the officer is getting the first order die, the tank can now get the second order die. And that way, you can actually can get first shot with your vehicle uh, during a turn. But again, that means you're using your commander for that purpose near that tank than you would instead of actually having him closer to some other infantry and supporting them. So that's the slow load rule. So those are the three rules I kind of wanted to cover. And this gives us essentially the rest of the rules that we need to pay attention to to fully utilize vehicles in a bolt action game. Okay. Now there are some other uh, types, modifiers, some of these rules that will come into play in your special circumstances later, as so I'll cover those rules either in a future video, such as with the uh, uh, artillery school, where some of these rules are going to be affected, or in special uh, videos after this, we're going to cover some special subjects that might impact how vehicles are used. All right? Okay, last time we talked about reserves, just the general reserve rules. But there's going to be uh, one additional rule that applies to reserves that you can elect to choose. 
Now some rules will specify you cannot use this rule, some will say you can. Uh, the rule is called outflank. It is used only on units that are coming in reserve. So let's just say I've got the a Stuart 5 in reserve and I have to declare when I put when I declare that the unit is in reserve I need to declare whether or not it is in outflank mode. Okay now when I outflank I'm actually going to come, have to choose one of the two sides so in secret when I declare that it's an outflank I will write down whether it's coming in to my left or my right and that I cannot change that that's what that's the rule now when it comes time just like regular reserves on first turn you have to give the unit a down order right because it can't come into in, in on turn one now unlike regular reserves outflank units cannot actually come in on turn two either because they're still outflanking so you'll have to give the unit a down order on the second turn as well beginning the third turn you are now able to bring the unit on now if you choose to bring the unit on during the third turn you give it a normal order die to advance or run or whatever and then you again use the order test at minus one unless your army has a special rule order test minus one in order to come on from reserve, just like a regular reserve. But let's just pretend here that my steward is going to come in on my right hand. So I'm going to be coming in. I want it to come in on this side of the table. On turn three, I can come in anywhere on the first 24 inches of the board on this side. I can bring it up, which means I can start it here and I can move it, you know, nine inches in or 18 if I run. Now, what's neat is that if you do happen, as I do in this case, have a road nearby. I can take advantage of that road as I'm coming in, and then I can come in and move, take my normal action. If I wait until turn four to bring in my outflanking reserve, I can bring it on anywhere up in this 36 inches, so I can bring it in on the side here. That's really annoying to the opponent if they happen to have something important back here, such as a forward-facing uh, large anti-tank or howitzer, anti-tank gun or howitzer. I'm going to come in and hit it with behind its gun shield and pretty much, I'm sure, get no cover on it. So it's there's a lot of things you can do when you harass, but again, we have to wait till turn four. If I bring it on turn five, I can come in anywhere along the table edge. So literally up to their back edge here. Okay. Now, one note without flanking, if the mission has an objective to leave off the opponent's table edge, you cannot come in from outflank and exit the same turn. You have to come in on, on the table during your when you come in on whatever turn you decide to come in on. And then the next turn you can move off the table. Okay? It's very, very important to remember that. Now, I have to caution you, please definitely read the scenario and make sure it does the scenario does not say outflanking not allowed. Because unless it says outflanking not allowed, if reserves are uh, available in that scenario, you can choose outflank. All right. So that's the last little bit of reserves, and it actually offers you quite a lot of uh, tactical flexibility and can really give you a way to kind of turn the tables on your opponent. All right. So that's really the vehicles in a nutshell. Again, we really haven't added a lot of rules. We've added some flavor to it, but we didn't really introduce anything really complex. So that's what I'm saying. I think this is a really simple system to, to kind of pick up. And if you have any questions, please go, feel free to put in the comments. And stay tuned for the next field exercise in which my friend Dave will be learning by playing his third game of bolt action using covering just the rules we covered today. So it's going to be an exciting battle report. Some real fun was had in this particular game as the, the forces duked it out, we saw a lot of what happens in the rules I just described. So, stay tuned. Thank you for sticking with me through this, especially if you're a new player interested. For If you know any players that are interested or want to get your buddies in, into the game, feel free to share, like, and subscribe, and definitely put the word out. Bring them here. I, this is, I don't think you're going to find any one location where you can kind of cover all the basic rules as we do here in this video set. So, stay tuned for the next video, which will be a field exercise dealing with combined arms. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye-bye.